Thanks everybody for thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to um, to have this crew together and to uh, to interact with you, especially. So we're going to ask a few questions as we go through this, and we we want to get your you know get your input. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat window. Um, you can use the chat or the Q and A window. The chat window is a little more interactive, um, so we prefer you use that one. But e either place you feel comfortable typing in questions or comments or or feedback, um, you know, please please do so as we go through this. Um, as uh, Megan introduced all of us um, today, uh, we did a presentation or, or a live panel like this a few months back. I think maybe four or five months back, and um, you know, with DJ and with another product manager here at uh, at Sneak, and it was really good. We had a lot of great uh, interactivity with the with the audience, and we talked a lot about you know adopting IAC and adding security practices in and uh, in in things, and also how you do that and still maintain the speed and the velocity that you want to get with IAC. We had uh, just written this ebook together, uh, Sneak and, and Engineer Better had written this ebook together. And so it was just barely published at the time that we had this last presentation. Uh, it's still available. It's free. Um, it's, it's a you know, fantastic resource that talks about a bit of a roadmap for adopting uh, IAC for speed and security. And, uh, and those are the things we'll focus on. What we didn't have last time, which we do now, uh, are, are these code samples. So if you're interested in actually trying out some examples of these practices that are outlined in this book, you can see that in these, these code samples. Um, there's you know, different stages of commits throughout these code samples that will line up with the things that are in the book and the practices that are in the book. So we encourage you uh, to go and, uh, and, and do that uh, and, and you can learn even more. Uh, but in the book, we, we have a bit of a, a, call it sort of a roadmap or a journey uh, of adoption. This is taking you know, a lot of feedback we've seen with customers that you know, each, each company, Sneak In, Engineer Better, uh, in our, our histories have, have worked with. Um, and you know some practices along the way that help with these uh, ideas of, of achieving speed and security with IAC. Uh, the last time we did this, we kind of focused on the early stages of, of adoption and that those first few things that you wanna to do. Today, what we're gonna focus on is a little bit of the later stages of production and sort of underneath this, this category of safety, um, some key, key functionalities that I think are desirable, key outcomes that are desirable. Uh, maintaining or minimizing drift after you've started to deploy things with IAC, making sure that things are functionally correct uh, when they're in production, and of course, making sure things are, are auditable uh, as well. Um, I see that somebody asked for the links and, and Stefan and others are posting those in the chat too. Um, so, uh, so we'll get those, uh, I'll get those here in just a second. But So that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, and again, as we said, we want this to be very interactive and you know, it's great that people are starting in the chat already. That's fantastic. Um, so we'll start with a question just to get some more uh, feedback into the chat. So, you know, as you're thinking about your own personal journeys um, and your organization's work with IAC today and, and kind of where you are, what, what kind of obstacles are you facing uh, in your adoption of IAC? Uh, a few of you may be lucky and say, well, you know, we're doing great. We've got this thing, this thing licked, uh, in which case we may turn you on as a, as a panelist here uh, to join us in, this, in the chat. Um, but a lot of people are facing other challenges. You think about, you know, people, process, and technology. You know, I encourage you to go and you know pop your pop your responses in the uh, in the chat panel so we can kind of see those and we can discuss them. But we see things like, um, you know, there's not enough skills, not enough people that know the format of choice that we've chosen, whether that might be Terraform or or you know Kubernetes or things. Uh, could be the technology we just haven't made a technology to choice, or we don't feel like we have enough tools to automate and implement and secure. Uh, could be process uh, as well and just not knowing what the right process is to bring all these different teams together. Um, I see a few things uh, coming into the chat here. Uh, DJ or Stefan, anything that you kind of see is sort of come. Actually, let me, let me ask a different question first. Of the customers you've talked to, how many do you see that you would say really do have this like down pat? I'm assuming it's probably low because that, you know, if people are calling an engineer better, they probably want help. So they probably identify as like, we're not doing this so great. Yeah, unfortunately, very few customers uh, call up saying, hey, we're having a great time. Can we hang out and pay you to do so? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we do have a selection bias. Um, we tend to work with a lot of large enterprises who um, 
you know, they have a lot of leg legacy heritage stuff. Um, so they're not starting from a clean slate. And sometimes the kind of uh, the join points between what's new and what's existing are the sticking points. That's where things become slow, where you're dependent on a central global networking team who need to make changes to a global load balancer manually um, and aren't quite on the uh, IAC uh, track yet. So th those kind of things um, often uh, hold back uh, further adoption. Uh, I don't know about Stefan, your, your thoughts? Yeah, and uh, another common pattern that I met with um, talking to um, users um, of, of the tools, the open source tool that we built um, is a little bit different is sometimes they are very skilled um, at one cloud provider. Let's say they, they automated like 99% of AWS deployment. And they are very happy about it. And then they had this different project on Azure or GCP and they are less skilled at this new provider and they don't have the time to get up to speed and like gain, I don't know, four years of knowledge in like three months. And here they take a lot of shortcuts and then um, the multi-cloud automation is definitely not as good um, in this new, um, this new cloud provider that it was with their um, AWS provider. That's a common pattern that I saw um, talking to users. Yeah, yeah. Good. And one thing too, I want to point out just uh, uh, real quick. We should have done this in introductions, but you know, Stefan, I you neglected to point out that you came from uh, you know a company called CloudSkiff, which we Sneak had just recently acquired. But you have an open source tool called Drift CTL, which is still open source, still available for everybody here that if you want to go and try it. Uh, that is a Drift uh, Drift management tool, um, and so a lot of experience around that. We'll get into that more. Uh, as we go through this, but uh, something that I would encourage you know everybody here to go and and, and check out uh, as well. Um, I saw a couple things come into the uh, the chat panel. So one person said struggling to pull out of a uh, inheritance model and realize a composition model. I'm not I'm not sure what that means. I don't know if um, if Christopher, if you have more details, or or DJ or Stefan, if you 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 know you maybe have more understanding of i'm not sure either um i would like probably imagine something around like legacy and and get started you creating new resources and and building on that um starting from i don't know something already there like it's um it's something quite common as well like you start automating new stuff but you inherit um you still have the legacy, the existing stuff that yeah. you have to import in Terraform or uh, any other tool, and it can take time and it can be an awfully long process. And the way to automate it, it is often quite ugly. The code is not maintainable or really like verbose. So it might be it might be something like this, yeah. and definitely it's a major um, blocker um, when you have like thousands of resources to import i think maybe um uh christopher it would be great to get your uh you know kind of a, a additional uh, input on this and maybe we can come back to it through throughout the uh throughout the session um if you're thinking from a kind of um programming model of you know composition sort of golang star versus inheritance and something more traditionally object oriented um that would be interesting to, to hear more about, actually. It's something that came up a little bit in the last session, uh, talking about Terraform modules and you know being able to compose those together to, to create a, a system. And in truth, it's something we don't tend to do a lot of in that um, when we're working with customers, it's of, often deploying one platform so that there's less need for reuse uh, between things. So, um, it, it would be interesting to, to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah, he followed up and said, uh, simple to import a resource. So he said Stefan was you know, kind of right. I think you, you both kind of nailed it. So it's simple to import a resource, um, but then to make the abstractions to migrate up to composable configuration um, from those individual modules is a, uh, models is a tough mindset to, uh, to keep modules. Yeah, is a tough, uh, tough mindset to keep. So yeah, I think, um, I think you nailed it there. The other is another person here mentioned inconsistency between the deployment and the state, right? So the, I think the intended desired state and the, the true state, which you know we're, we're calling drift and we'll definitely definitely be drilling into that a little bit more today. And then incomplete 
you know, providers for AWS, Azure, and, and OpenStack, and probably other things uh, as well. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, sorry, Daniel. I, I was just going to say that the incomplete providers are definitely a pain. And this is where, um, certainly in my experience, the, we work a lot with um, teams who are going from operations and kind of traditional system admin into infrastructure as code and treating it like a software development project, which uh, I have found time and again that people, once they click into that change and feel empowered, it's a really um, satisfying one for them motivation wise, you know, building something instead of doing daily toil. Um, but having some Golang skills to be able to contribute to Terraform providers and dig yourself out of a corner, that, that's a totally mixed metaphor, but you know what I mean, um, <laughs> is, is definitely useful. I also saw that Robert um, said earlier, um, resource provisioning time to the cloud platforms. I'm going to make no comments about which ones you may be talking about, but I have my suspicions. <laughs> Yeah, so we also mentioned, uh, you know, missing operations. I think, you know, like real programming operations, like if statements. We had in the last one, we talked about item potency, right? Being able to run your pipelines, run your plan and apply for Terraform and always get the same, the same output, which is a challenge when you don't, you can't test, like you can't do an if statement or a case statement or switch or things like that, right? Um, so you have to be creative and it's a, it's a complex problem, I think. Isn't there a new uh, addition to Terraform uh, that has uh, more SDK functionality? You know. yeah. yeah, they have an SDK now. And I think, I, I don't know, Esteban, you, may, you probably know more than I do about it, but I, I think they've been debating whether to add more programming like uh, control. Loops. Yeah, you, you have more control in the latest versions of Terraform, but you're right, CDK, um, you can, with CDK, you can basically like write your Terraform, you're using like, JavaScript or something, and it converts then um, the code back to Terraform, the, the standard HTL, so it can be like run, so you can have a, a more uh, complex logic in your um, like traditional programming language and have, I don't know, big iteratives, um, iterations, if statements, and then all, all the yada yada that you used to and generate in the end HTL. It's definitely something new and in the Terraform environment. There's also um, technologies like uh, Pulumi. Um, I remember speaking to those folks at KubeCon where it's more of a, um, a, a the opposite of declarative, imperative uh, programming model, which um, would definitely be more flexible. I would temper this um, conversation, though, by saying that there's great power in declarative simplicity. And I can totally imagine edge cases where you'd need to do something that um, maybe isn't straightforward, but... Uh, Generally, I, I would, if I found myself needing more uh, flow control statements, I would probably want to take a step back just to double check, like, is this really the best way of solving this problem or is it the simplest way? Sometimes it absolutely will be, um, but other times it might be a smell that maybe uh, you're doing some working against the tooling rather than with it. Yep. Yeah, I see another comment here too from Karen about um, the challenge of migrating between existing you know, version. So as folks like Terraform, I think, produce a new version of their, of their format, uh, you know, it's maybe not com it, compatible with the previous versions of their format, which is a challenge, I think, all around too. I think it's a challenge for somebody like for Sneak too, where we have a, this whole set of rules that work well with a version and there's a new version and some things change and the rules have to be adjusted and policy checks have to be um, adapted. Um, it's but yeah, it, it's definitely a problem. We've been bitten by it in the past. And um, this ties into one of the themes in the ebook about um, reproducibility and making sure that everything that goes into your pipeline is version <clears throat> is versioned and you can pin it to a particular version. It, it's all very well, um, you know, saying, well, we've got this Git repository, which holds some uh, Terraform config, and we're going to be really uh, controlled about which versions of that make, it way th make their way through um, different environments. But if, uh, I don't know, you're using Jenkins and a Terraform plugin or something like that, which auto updates, then that could totally invalidate all of your testing, all of your promotion. Um, so yeah, definitely being restrictive about, okay, there's a new version of Terraform, got to be tested before we allow this any further uh, through our uh, you know, uh, procession of environments, because uh, I've definitely felt that pain. Yeah, for sure. All right, I'm going to go to the next question just so we can... Uh continue on here, but um, I, I'm curious too, in, in your organizations, 
who's responsible for for IAC. We've seen we've seen organizations that have just like we're full of DevOps and the developers can write whatever they want. It's their responsibility to own it, maintain it, you know, keep it uh, keep it healthy over time. Other organizations who have said we're going with more of a centralized model. Um, you know, our app teams can come in and request things, and maybe they can make some one-off changes. But for the most part, we're going to centrally control things. And we've seen people who have even said, you know, everything is coming through our infrastructure team. They're the only ones that can do anything. Um, and we're not going to let anybody else do do anything. And uh, just kind of curious where people are in that thinking, uh, and also, you know, where you think it will go in the future. So if you have any, um, you know, input on that, we'd love to see that in the in the chat. We see a, a mix of those things. Any um, Correct. thoughts there? Kind of what what sort of mixes you guys see, DJ and uh, uh, sure. Um, as a consultancy, we see quite a few different models. And as a consultancy that gets called in when people are facing challenges, one of the ones that we see, um, you know, different different organizations work different ways, and there are many different ways of being productive. Uh, so there's not necessarily one universal right answer, but where we do see people have problems is where those um, responsibilities are not clearly defined, where you've got a platform team who are kind of doing all the back end infrastructure stuff, but they're not really running platform as a product and with developers as customers in mind. They're just kind of the ops people with a new name. But then you've got some developers who are managing infrastructure and only bits of the infrastructure that gets to be a mess really quickly. So I think uh, having clearly defined responsibilities, whatever those responsibilities are, is better than um, you know having a kind of mishmash where the gaps can uh, occur, especially when we're talking about things like safety okay. and security. You know, if uh, it, it's not clear what's been tested and what hasn't, that's definitely dangerous. If it's not clear who's responsible for something, then who's responsibility for the security of that and making sure that it's auditable and that things are properly configured. Um, yeah, clear definition of roles is uh, a thing to strive for. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, you read, you, you see all the headlines about breaches and a lot of them start from some sort of misconfiguration. And I think there's, you know, there's a couple of different ways that that happens, but it, you know, it, it falls to controls to, to some degree, but also just not, maybe not people knowing like who's, who's actually responsible for making sure this thing is still in the right controls. Um, and, it, you know, we're going to talk about drift, as we said a little bit later, but things can drift even from what we said it was going to be to what the actual state is. Uh, so I think that that clear definition of who's responsible for it, not just defining it, but then maintaining it um, over time is is critical. I see um, Robert Newman um, has contributed that uh, their whole Scrum uh, development team is responsible. Those kind of cross-functional teams can be so productive. Um, having transitioned from being mostly a Java developer to doing kind of a full stack infrastructure all the way uh, through, um, it can be a challenge for folks. And there's, um, I'm a big fan of uh, kind of platform as a product type um, setups where you've got a team who are, not managing infrastructure, but they provide self-service platforms to developers. So they don't necessarily have to um, kind of uh, worry about those lower levels of abstraction. And then uh, Christopher, on the other hand, um, is uh, saying there's no kind of centralized uh, use uh, in uh, Christopher's organization. The developers are relying on the SRE team to handle all the infrastructure stuff. So uh, kind of already seeing two quite different ways of doing it there. Yep, yep, for sure. Okay, let's go to our next one. This one's a, a poll question, so you can you don't have to type your answers. Although we would love to see um, you know if you have some details in the chat. Um, but this is about the types of tests you use. So we're talking about you know who runs this and you know some of the challenges you have. But also curious, and we we chat a little bit about this. That you know uh, testing these things before you deploy, and even sometimes after you deploy. Um, you know, your, your infrastructure. I'm just kind of curious as to what types of tests um, everybody uh, uses here. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen. You should be able to pick um, uh, a choice here. I think you can only pick one. I know probably several people are running more than one. Pick the one that's sort of the biggest, I guess, um, or most, most common um, that you're using. Um, DJ Stefan, what kinds of kinds of things do you see is sort of maybe starting with like early adopters, the first things that people do to like more mature uh, organizations? 
Yeah, sure. probably the first thing uh, people can use is like this very simple built-in validation from like Terraform validate. It's the most the most basic thing that you can do, and then you can probably very easily just launch a, a live um, linter. Um, like there's different linters on the um, on the market from TF Lint to to our own SNCC IC um, Analyzer. So that's the kind of things that can bring a, a an initial high quality feedback loop it's to, to start with that and it's already great because you have already quality feedback instantaneously and and then you can move on like to much more advanced uh, like unit testing and 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 more advanced testing as well and up to i don't know you can even finish with um um I, I one product I love from Chef uh, was in spec. Uh, so you can write in Ruby fully. Um, you, you can test all your compliance using pretty simple Ruby checks and and that you can run that at the very end of your pipeline to just ensure that everything is definitely the way you intended it to be um, by writing it properly. That's the kind of things you can you can do. Just a few examples, a ton of ton of different examples can be done. Terra test. Terra test. Uh, I think Daniel, you have probably a lot to say on on this one. It's it's wonderful. It's but it's quite complicated for early users to use. Like it's you basically write all your tests using Golang, so it requires a bit of time and skills as well. But Terra test is great. Yeah, and uh, again, Golang. Uh, we're we're not being paid by anybody uh, offering Golang training, honest. Um, but yeah, useful useful skill to have um, for for people treating infrastructure as code. Regardless of the tool, I'd probably just uh, recommend to make if there is anyone on the session or watching this who is, you know, not from a software development background and um, maybe from more of an infrastructure or admin ops side to really try and embrace testing and embrace early testing as much as you can. Um, getting that fast feedback and knowing quickly when you've done something wrong um, is, is so valuable. A, a customer uh, that we're working with um, has has some unit tests for some of their uh, in infrastructure uh, projects and they just weren't running them as part of the uh, ci build um and you know our consultants were like uh why do you have these but you're not running them and um yeah they, they went about making that change and one of the engineers on that team one of the customer engineers was like oh this is really good we find out much faster when things are wrong i was like, yes that's exactly the point <laughs> so if you can test do and do it as as early as you can yeah, the, the results here are pretty interesting too. So we've got, we've got a, you know, basically kind of a split between two. There's, you know, every, there's a little, there are a few answers for everything, but um, a split between the two. So one, we're not doing much automated testing yet. Uh, and the other is linters um, and, and some of those early sort of feedback type, uh, type checks. Um, for the other ones, the, you know, the more full featured security and, and uh, checks and policy uh, tools, um, relatively low uh, usage, which is not, I mean, I don't think that's a, a different answer that we would get if we had 5,000 people here. Um, it's probably, you know, fairly same in terms of percentages, but um, yeah, fairly, fairly consistent there. Okay, let's talk about, um, you know, actually implementing these changes. So um, as you go through um, we talked about automatically testing and, and some people are, are doing that and some people you know, haven't really yet. But for, if you are doing some automatic testing, um, do you promote these changes through multiple environments? In other words, do you have several stages that it goes through to make sure everything is working as expected uh, prior to reaching that production stage? So really sort of having that thorough pipeline that you're testing for IAC. This is pretty common, I think, in, in software development or becoming more and more common, I think, in software development and really kind of getting to treating your IAC as if it's a, you know, it, it, it is, you know, in this case, a software thing, right, a, a product. So curious um, if people are doing that, let me make the question live here uh, for you. So you can uh, pop an answer in there too. Um, Again, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd say this is so important. Um, the number of folks who test the hell out of their software and then infrastructure 
um, you know, th they're just applying it straight to prod without it going through any earlier environments. It's, um, you know, that's kind of undermines all of the testing that goes on in the, in the software process. And nobody wants to be the person that makes a, a prod change and causes a, a massive outage. Um, you know, ask the people at uh, Facebook who made the, uh, uh, the, that networking config change. Um, so it, it's super important. Um, and there's another benefit that you get from having promotion through different environments. One of the things that we talk about in the uh, ebook and in um, the code examples is we're quite big fans, uh, Engineer Better, of having like one instance of a pipeline representing one environment. And once you do that, and if you start from the assumption that everything uh, that you need for an environment should be creatable through a pipeline automatically. Just spin up a new pipeline and it should run and give you everything that you need for a, a, an environment by itself. That sets you up to chain those together so that then you can test them one after the other, but also starts giving you so much more flexibility in kind of providing development environments for the software developers that are using your infrastructure. On the subject of the type of testing, you know, um, we, we talked about more the kind of unit testing. What do you do close to the commit? There's some for the SREs here. I think there's some really interesting intersections between things like acceptance testing and service level indicators. You know, you want to be testing your infrastructure and the things running on it as if you are an end user. You know, can you log into the system? Uh, not just is the login page returning healthy when I hit the health check endpoint. You know, can write tests that step through things like a user. That gives you your SLIs. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, service level indicators and also gives you real confidence that stuff's working, not just metrics, not just, you know, uh, response rates and those sorts of things, but like you've got some proper confidence that somebody stepped through each of these stages. And if our test can do it, a user can do it. And if a user is telling me that they can't do it and our test just ran and said that they can, maybe it's a, you know, problem exists between keyboard and chair type problem, which as an operator is a useful uh, kind of uh, way of uh, triaging things yeah yeah one one well, first let me just say this there's an interesting so looking at the poll results interesting zero people said they're they're actually fully automated uh with these multiple stages all the way through production a few said they're, they're close but not quite all the way through um i just you know again not something that i think is uncommon i we before we did the book um we had actually commissioned a survey to go out and just talk to iac users and see kind of where they were in their their journeys and how, you know, how good they felt they were doing and what sort of things they were doing. And a very small number of people, uh, it was, I think, 6% or 7% of the respondents, there were like 500 respondents, uh, and, and not just sneak customers, this was, you know, uh, a wide audience, who said they thought they were doing, you know, sort of best in class IAC automation and testing and security and management uh, all the way through. So, you know, if you're in that group of of people who say zero, which is everybody on the on the on the uh, joining us today, um, you know, don't feel like you're way behind. I think it's a fairly common thing. People are still working to that. Uh, the other thing that was interesting as we worked on this book, uh, DJ, was the the notion of the pipelines. And you know, we, for, if you go through the code examples, like they're set up for Jenkins, I think, right? And we talked about like what what tools should we use? Should we use Jenkins? Um, should we use something else? There were challenges we had with Jenkins, right? Because it's it's good for some things, but for IEC, there you know there are specific things, you know, outcomes that you want to achieve that Jenkins you know doesn't necessarily inherently understand. Um, so curious, and I've seen some other some other tools that are they're maybe not CI tools or pipeline tools per se, but are, are interesting sort of IEC specific testing tools where they do try and replicate this idea of having these multiple environments, either simulated deployments or not. Have you seen much of that in your in your practice, either one of you, TJ or Stefan, or anybody here, if you're using something like that? Definitely be interested in uh, hearing what uh, the, the people on the call uh, have, have to say on, on that one. Um, we actually did a series of blog posts on this. I don't think I can get the link handily whilst also focusing on uh, the, the, the webinar. But, uh, we did a series of blog posts comparing, inspired by the work on the ebook, um, to look at uh, Jenkins, Argo, Workflows, Tekton, and um, a, a kind of niche a tool called Concourse that um, we're quite fond of. And um, 
Tekton and Argo um, definitely uh, support pipelines in a better fashion. They tend to be quite GitOps driven in that there's got to be one thing that triggers the, the whole pipeline. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a file or a Git repo with a file with all of the versions in, and then you've got to write something to update all those versions when a new thing becomes available, um, which Concourse does more elegantly. But anything that um, is CI as code or declarative CI config um, and allows a whole pipeline workflow rather than discrete individual jobs, you know. Um, Stefan, what, what about you? What have you seen work here? Well, I've seen things not work uh, definitely like very badly. It And it falls back again on the question. I think it, it was Christopher like uh, 10 minutes ago um, telling about the modules and the versions and the dependencies and the versions of the providers and the, it probably even up to the Terraform versions as well. Um, and I even seen um development or staging environments like they were working very well because people were like pushing and testing like every day or hour or so but production much much less uh often and and basically the impact in, in production uh for the 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 small focus that you have on your module and you bump the versions and you upgrade it it's all it's all okay and then at the end it's big day you deploy something and as it's not tested and automated up to production then that's when things break because there's too much of a gap um, from the version that was actually deployed in production and the new modules and the and new um, version and dependencies for from the, the Terraform providers are of versions from Terraform itself. And sometimes it was even like just the pipeline not uh, being like uh, com uh, compatible with what was expected from that upgrade for uh, production directly. So that's that's definitely the kind of issues as well that you can have uh, here. And that's why testing from dev staging to production is definitely so important. And you have like, um, tool as well like uh kitchen terraform uh it's it's it comes from test kitchen uh, from the chef days and and today it still works very well to iterate through uh, a, a set of uh, configuration uh, variables and you can inject data from um from your, your your test cases to test and simulate up to production if you want to and and you can even like did you mention like definitely test for real if the result um, actually is the one uh, that is expected. Yeah, yeah there, uh, there's a, uh, a comment or question, I guess, in here from, from Don about, um, you know, just getting started on, on IAC and wanting to get them, get some advice on a simple start to get going. I'll just, I'll plug, shamelessly plug the ebook again. Uh, a lot of the stuff early in the book is, is very simple simple sounding at least been somewhat simple to do as you're getting started just things like you know they'll just store your iac on your laptop put it into a shared code repository and start collaborating on it there and follow sort of that software development practice so there's some good advice for just even the early stage things to set you up for better success as you as you start to you know bring this into production um but dj stefan any any feedback you would have uh Def definitely agree with you on the book because we we used our experience kind of taking teams through this journey um and, and there's a fictional account of uh, perry i believe who is a yeah, uh, operator yeah. who turns into an iac uh kind of developer um so hopefully if we've done our job well then some of that should be relatable um so skip to that section that's about that journey um, and if it's not relatable let us know we can improve it um <clears throat> the things that jim mentioned um getting it under source control, making sure that, um, you know, you standardize your formatting. I know that sounds really trivial, but like, if you're going to work with other people, it will make your life a lot easier. Find some way of testing things. Um, once you found a way of testing it on demand through your own CLI, uh, look at integrating uh, uh, into a CI server, something that will, every time you commit, run those tests. Uh, so you start to get certainty on it. Then you can start thinking about continuous deployment and, you know, okay, once we've run those tests, shall we do a Terraform apply automatically on every commit uh, to, to an environment? I expect that you'll find, uh, depending on the sector you're in and the kind of organization you're in, you may find some resistance, um, security folks um, who are objecting to things being automatically applied, even if it's in dev environments. 
hopefully there's some arguments in the book that you know we use when we take people on this journey and take organizations on a transformational journey about why it's safer and better to do things these uh, kind of ways so hopefully those, those will be of um, help but whatever you can do whatever small incremental improvements you can make i encourage you to do it uh, you know, every every little helps. Every little thing that's automatically, continually checking that things are better is better than nothing at all. Yeah, and I would just simply add, like, install those little plugins in your in VS Code or whatever. You can have the linting. You can have all the quick feedback that you need. Well, as a developer, you want that feedback as soon as possible, and that will help you get started. You can even have like um, small snippets with good default that can be tested automatically uh, in VS Code or other um, or other IDEs. So definitely do this and it's it's highly helpful even when you're uh, um, like scaled or more experienced in, in the area. Yeah. yeah, I'll just say too, uh, again, on the on the responses to this, this question in particular, there's a good there's a good number like there's it's around it's 28% basically who said they're running a Terraform plan and then it's straight on to production. So this whole idea of having these multiple environments and promoting through it and automating all this, right? Uh, it's not something that everybody's doing yet. So don't feel like you're way behind the curve. Like everybody's learning this at the same time. So um, there are good communities for this too. I think, um, you know, in, in you should definitely, you know, hop in there. I know Terraform's got a huge open source uh, community. Drift CTL has a huge open source community when you start to get into tools and things like that. Some of these other tools we mentioned, Terra, Test and, and others um, have open communities too. So you can definitely jump in there and start learning and asking questions. Um, I do wanna move forward um, because we said we were gonna talk about Drift and we're getting to that point now. So we'll, we'll start with this. Um, how frequently are you reapplying your IAC? And in particular, you know, as a practice, reapplying your IAC, even if nothing has changed, just reapplying it. And I think when we talked about this in the uh, in the ebook, the idea was, you know, to help to converge things back to what the expected state is, right? Um, and and just sort of make sure that we're we're always capturing those things. But um, just kind of curious what other people were doing. But DJ Stefan, any? I'm going to say that Stefan has probably got way more uh, deep insight on, on this uh, given his career history. Um, from the ebooks perspective, we were talking about the three R's, which I think is Martin Smith, who's ex Google and ex Pivotal's um, a term of ro rotate, uh, repair, repave. Make your credentials easy, rotate, um, repair, apply patches, all of these things that having uh, IAC and a CI pipeline will help with, but also repave of. If you're continually reapplying things, then any drift, whether it's detected or not, will uh, be blatted. You know, you'll be over uh, riding it with uh, what you've got desired or Terraform will throw throw a, a funny turn and tell you, hey, things have changed. I don't like this. I'm not going to apply. And you get a big red failed build in your uh, CI pipeline. So <clears throat> from that uh, point of view, uh, that, that's valuable. This may be something that just reapplying won't do in the repaving front um, and a bit of a tangent, so I won't talk about it for very long. Um, but recreating systems, you know, if, if something does get into your um, your production infrastructure, if you're tearing it down and recreating it and like slowly uh, doing a rolling update of pods or whatever, um, at least then you've got a short time to live on uh, anything that's got into your system. The worst thing than um, you know, uh, malicious code being in your system is malicious code that's been in your system for six months, harvesting data with no visible signs. It's not trying to make any network egress. And then all of a sudden it sends the whole lot out to nefarious hackers somewhere. So if you can you know, minimize your exposure by uh, recreating things, uh, that'd be good. But Stefan, uh, definitely uh, would love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I would even add like um, that you, in this in this process of uh, applying uh, as soon as possible and as often as possible your infrastructure as code, um, I would as well, and before applying it, I would use a tool like Drift CTL, the one um, that we created, the open source tool, uh, Drift Control, because what you want to ensure is the parity between um, the state that you currently have 
as in, in terms of Terraform, it's the Terraform state. And you probably have many of them but because probably you have a state for your I abuses, for your S3 buckets, for your Kubernetes or something. And you want to ensure that parity between two states, aggregated states, and um, the reality on the APIs on AWS or something, or between regions as well, and before doing anything else. So you want to start from a clean state and beware, Terraform apply does not actually um, enforces the parity. It just basically uses a, um, a, a, a it, the state is not a conversion of the HCL. It's also um, interacting with the API from AWS or other cloud provider. And it may make changes to that state. It's meant that way. It's not It's the source of truth. And that's why um, in reapplying stuff, sometimes you can end up importing importing sorry um manually added um resources it's um hugely disappointing like a lot of people um can be uh, can have bad surprises i was the first one to have like terrible surprises with like manually added rules or some settings um and uh, changing s3 etc so that's uh, a reason why i would do two things um regularly um first check for the parity between your state and the reality. And depending on the, the result of that clean state, then apply again anything because you're sure that what you wanted did not change from the last time that you uh, applied it and it was working. Because the worst thing you can do is basically be um, think that you are secure because, well, I turn from applied. It's okay. Well, no, you just applied like your security group is now open to the world. Good job. It's on, it's on your Terraform state. So yeah, I would do a check before that. Yeah. Yeah. Responses here. So we had, um, you know, around 14% who said they do this often and automatically, which is, which is great. Um, but we also had 32% who said they never do this. Um, and so why, you know, why bother if, if nothing's changed? And I, that was a bit of a flippant addition to the uh, response on my part, but, um, but still 32% who are never doing this. So I think it's, you know, it is a great practice. The, the bulk of people, about 45% said they do this occasionally, but it's ad hoc, like it's not, a, it's not an automated thing. Um, so definitely room for improvement. I think for time purposes, I'm gonna move ahead to the next question because it Dig, digs a little bit deeper here. Um, and just curious, how often are changes made to your infrastructure, the things that you're managing with IAC outside of your outside of your software practice here, outside of that IAC uh, coding and, and pipelines? Um, this is, you know, I think of probably a fairly common problem. I know, Stefan, you, this is one you've been spending a lot of time on um, in the last couple of years, but um, any like what, what do you see out there well the reality is um always fun because very often you you i met a lot of people that were like yeah we have all the good practices in place nobody can do this or that etc but then you dig a little deeper and say okay you don't have customers like you're not a consultancy you don't hand over like accounts to someone uh, are you sure it's completely locked are you sure that even i don't know you don't even have any single service that is authenticated. Um, so basically uh, nothing runs on your infrastructure, nothing is live, nothing like, did you unplug the full <laughs> infrastructure and you fired the whole team or what? So <laughs> the reality sometimes um, is a bit different. You always have this team on call during a weekend. They have to um, do something quickly and basically maybe they don't even have the time to change this on, on Terraform. And the thing they will do it like on Monday, they, they will report and they will, they will do it properly on Monday morning. And guess what? They forgot. And that that's when all the, the manual changes uh, happen. And uh, you have all those authenticate scripts as well. Like, I don't know, backup scripts for hard disk or things like that. And sometimes um, they are authenticated. They do actually make some changes on the APIs. And sometimes you have bugs on the scripts as well. And for some reason, like you, you end up with 10,000 EBS duplicated uh, over the night. And I've seen this. So that's, um, it's not even drift, it's just pure bug. But it's, and it's in the end, it's definitely um, manual changes because it's not 
under control by any code or any real intention and definitely not tested. I think the, uh, yeah, th this goes to show the uh, importance of um, being able to detect and visualize, uh, detect drift and visualize the state of systems. Because exactly as Stefan says, there will be times when it's entirely legitimate for people to make manual changes. You know, it's an emergency. We don't have time to push it through the pipelines. They'll forget to backport it. I think we even talk about that in the, in the book uh, as an example, which is based on a real life experience. Um, so yeah, being able to see what the state of things is and detect automatically when things have diverged from what you want, uh, really critical. Yeah, the responses here are kind of just basically spread across the the four response the four choices, which you know was basically zero. No changes can happen except in pipelines, which is as Stefan said is probably not quite right. But the next choice was twenty five percent, fifty percent, seventy five percent. Maybe kind of scary to see that still seventy five percent or more uh, of changes are happening outside of these pipelines and outside of the software practice uh, for a fairly significant number of people, twenty seven percent. So that's still uh, it's still a bunch. I think too, given you know what we were chatting about around the first question, where you know it's it's one thing I think if you're just starting from scratch and you're you know you're a brand new company and everything's done in IC from day one and you know you you have some chance of everything being in the pipeline and captured in code. Most companies aren't that way, and so a lot of companies are trying to bring things in to uh, to IAC. When you have that mixed model, I would imagine you know some people don't know which resources are manually managed and which resources are managed via IAC and they just make changes and don't know that they've affected somebody else's work. Uh, I can see that being an issue too. And drift detection is a great way of uh, identifying that and finding out like, hey, uh, you know, Rachel and the other team, she didn't realize that this is uh, being applied automatically and, you know, we found that it's diverged. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, let me pop up this next question because we are just down to our last couple of minutes. Um, do, uh, for the folks that are here, do you actually have something that you're using today to do any kind of drift detection? Some people, we've seen people who do just sort of manual audits, which can be hard, or they're trying to compare the, you know, manually compare the deployed state to what's in, in IAC. There's loads of tools. We talked about drift CTL as an open source um, tool and there are others there. Um, it's kind of curious how many people have something that they're doing uh, there. Um, DJ Stefan, what's what's sort of the spread of people that you're uh, you're seeing there? Well, I've seen and I've used um, and created a lot of internal tools, like based around like I don't know the AWS CLI command or um, during the chef years um, you could do a lot of things act to actually list and compare uh, based on um, like um, inventories that you could have like chef server was a, a huge a great resource a few years ago to do this so you could do things like this but it was highly you had to do a lot of um, manual um, manual steps uh, yeah that's that's one of the reasons that we created drift ctl it's it's so like easy to use it you can aggregate and uh, all the states that you want it works for the free main um cloud providers today and you can do even do things that we do we actually do in on in real life like having multiple terraform states um or running them at some point on s3 and sometimes stored on terraform cloud and sometimes stored somewhere else and you can aggregate them all and compare it um so that's one of the reasons yeah drift ctl uh, exists because yeah. yeah i think it's a great point too because i you know as a as a simple marketing minded person the, the extent of terraform that i've used is like there's a state file and that's it it's just very simple right because i deploy like three things and then i destroy it but real the real life is you're going to have multiple state files and maybe in different places and you, you you have to have a converged view of the world to really know what's what's happening yeah and definitely you do not want to have everything on single state the, the day it's corrupt <laughs> you're not happy about it at all <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure uh i'm going to uh we'll skip over this question because i want to get this because i know we're we're going to be uh out of time here in just a second i do want to thank um 
first of all, thank DJ and Stefan for joining us and thank the Linux Foundation for, uh, for hosting us today and especially thank everybody for, uh, for your participation and for just joining us and taking time out of your day uh, to be here with us. Um, if you are interested in, in learning more, we have loads of resources for you. The ebook and, um, and the code samples we posted early in the chat, if you scroll way back up to the top, you'll find those links and we'll make this presentation available. And of course the recording will be available as well. You can get to Sneak. If you wanna learn more about Sneak IEC, we do have a security tool for, for your IEC. We'd love to have you uh, and, and talk more about that, obviously. Um, Drift CTL, as we mentioned, um, uh, we acquired a company called Cl CloudSkiff who had an open source tool called Drift CTL. It's still an open source tool. It's still called Drift CTL. Uh, and we would love to have you participate in that community as well and use that tool. Um, and then Engineer Better, of course, uh, fantastic uh, consultancy. If you're looking for help and you need some guidance with these with these things and these practices and, and implementing them, um, we encourage you to you know reach out to Engineer Better and, and and bring them in and see what they can what they can do for you. But um, you know, really appreciate uh, everybody joining us, and uh, and I guess we will end there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And thank you, Daniel and Stefan. Um, it was a very engaging presentation today. And as Jim mentioned, uh, this will be available on the Linux Foundation YouTube page, as well as the uh, webinars page where you found to register. And we hope to see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.